Hi there. Hey, uh, my name is Larry Pesci, and uh, I'm the director of research, amongst a few other hats, uh, at uh, In Guardians. And I'm here to talk a little bit today about um, some uh, RFID type uh, cards from uh, HID Global, and we're going to do some HID card hacking uh, here at KringleCon. Uh, so uh, first up, uh, a big thanks uh, to Santa for inviting me. Um, you know, it took a little bit of time uh, to get here. Uh, a couple flights, um, you know, masks, secret locations. Um, but uh, you know, many of my uh, my other presenters are saying it's uh, it's it's pretty cold. But um, I'm I'm from New England and and we get a, a fair bit of snow and it's not as cold as some other places, uh, but uh, certainly uh, it's still you know jeans and t-shirt weather uh, here uh, at the North Pole even though it is a little blustery. Now you don't want to stay outside for very long, but uh, certainly uh, it's uh, it's still quite reasonable. So a big thanks to uh, to Santa for the invite uh, and for uh, the hospitality. All right, without further ado, uh, let's uh, start looking uh, at the HIDPROX 2 uh, from HID Corporation. Uh, so the HIDPROX 2 is based on uh, some low-frequency um, RFID-based technology. They are uh, fairly simple. Uh, they don't have any security mechanism uh, to them. Uh, you read the card, and they typically spit out a unique number of some sort. Uh, they're incredibly uh, popular for uh, physical access control, uh, for gaining access into various organizations, uh, typically door access, whether that be uh, you know, potentially into the front door of a multi-tenant facility, uh, into office suites, and you know, potentially even into some uh, secure uh, data centers. And I'm using air quotes here for secure. Um, it, to restrict access into specific locations uh, where there may be some more uh, sensitive types of things that we need to restrict access to. Okay. Uh, they are, in fact, typically low cost. There are a couple of different um, uh, solutions within uh, HID's uh, Prox uh, product line, uh, but we're specifically going to be focusing on the uh, HID Prox 2, uh, specifically um, from some quotes from uh, Stephanie Ardilly, uh, the product manager uh, at HID Global, uh, who states that legacy 125 kilohertz, that's the low frequency, uh, proximity technology is still in place at around 70 to 80% of all physical access control deployments in the US. And it will be a long time before that changes. And and absolutely, I can, I can see that figure based on the number of times I've gone into facilities and seen uh, the HIDPROX2 solutions, uh, as well as the being for a long time. Uh, typically, these installs going into organizations are those that um, are a fixed asset, and there's no push to replace them. Uh, given that they're installed, they're working, uh, and it will be fairly expensive uh, to, to make that happen. Oh, hey, so what's, uh, what does it all look like? Well, we've got a couple of components uh, to, uh, to the system. Uh, on the left, we've got our uh, HID Prox2 uh, reader, uh, where we present uh, the card to the reader and the uh, 125 kilohertz uh, RF energy uh, transpires. The card is activated by the presence of RF energy uh, through some capacitive inductance. Um, and the card activates, spits out a number. Uh, and in this case, access to Santa's, uh, Santa's workshop. Now, the unique number from the card is translated uh, via uh, wire to some sort of uh, controller that is the part that is uh, checking for which numbers are allowed into, uh, into uh, which doors and then triggers the unlock events uh, for those, uh, those doors. Now, on the wired side, uh, on, on the back of the, the, the HIDPROX2 reader, uh, it gets translated to uh, the Wiegand protocol, uh, which is a, uh, a well-known, well-documented standard that is unencrypted uh, on the back end. 
So, you know, potentially in some of these systems, we have a couple of other opportunities for us to interact with them and not just on the RF side. Uh, we could potentially uh, intercept that Wigan protocol on the wire, or we could potentially find somewhere on the network uh, the systems that are potentially uh, integrating with the door controllers uh, for the read of the badges and the unlock codes. Uh, you know, typical um, Windows uh, or, or Linux-based system uh, that would be subject to various network uh, traditional type of pen test attacks on the network. All right, <clears throat> so let's take a look at the, the cards themselves. Well, the cards themselves do provide us a little bit of uh, information. Uh, when presented to a reader, when activated, they do spit out a unique number uh, to the reader, which is then interpreted uh, and sent Wigan protocol to the controller, which verifies, hey, this card number is allowed uh, into this door or not. Um, on the card itself, there are some numbers printed. Uh, there are uh, the two numbers being the unique card identifier and the sales order tracking number. Now, for the most part, that sales order tracking number is not particularly useful uh, to us. Uh, but that card ID number is. Uh, that card unique ID number is uh, intended to be unique per card. Um, but if we can read that physically, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us uh, to have that be a secure mechanism. But what really happens is that card ID number is combined with a facility number or a unique you know, uh, purchaser or a unique location uh, facility number, which is not printed on the card and it's only inspected uh, and transferred in the air uh, when read. So a combination of a hidden facility number and a unique card ID number that is printed on the outside of the card. One of the things that I think that's pretty neat uh, about what HID did, uh, and potentially comes back to, to bite them a little bit, is HID didn't develop their own RFID-based technologies. They actually uh, used some, uh, some RFID technology that was already out there from Atmel, specifically uh, the T5557. And also, uh, I think the new one is the T5577, which to the best of my knowledge, is uh, backwards uh, compatible. Now, the thing that makes this interesting is that the Atmel T5557 chipset is publicly available and it's usable for other purposes and is readily available uh, in, in the market. And HID Global just decided to uh, adopt this chipset uh, for, for their application. What that means is that we could potentially purchase uh, other cards from other systems that are leveraging this chipset to be able to use uh, within our HID Prox card to uh, support its systems. All right, so looking at uh, that data format we for what is spit into the air um, comprised of that facility code and the unique card ID. Uh, the facility code is between uh, 1 and 255. Uh, zero is reserved for internal uh, HID uh, corporation uh, development and so forth. Uh, and then the unique card ID is between 1 and 65,535, uh, where zero is reserved for uh, HID's internal uh, stuff as well. So we have a facility code between 1 and 255, and for each one of those facility car codes, we can have a unique uh, card identifier. So uh, I can walk up to uh, a facility and uh, see two different cards um, out in front uh, of the building. Maybe someone's wearing them and note that they have the same card ID. Uh, in fact, in, likely in this case, uh, the uh, facility code is different. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about you know, some of those facility codes and the card IDs. So once that uh, the data is on the card, we print the card ID unique uh, on the outside, we've got our uh, facility code. Um, that data is then encoded and then um, happens to be encoded to a length of a 26-bit data format. Um, and then at the reader, it fits conveniently within a single uh, Wigand protocol 26-bit data format. So it fits nicely for one one packet. Now, some of um, 
HID's uh, uh, later uh, adaptations, the HID Corporate 1000, um, has the ability to have longer facility code and card IDs, uh, resulting in longer output of between 34 to 37 bits. Uh, but it doesn't have any uh, additional security protections. Uh, it is uh, specifically related to the availability of the quote key space, those unique identifiers. So how would I interact uh, with uh, some of these hid cards and, and readers? Well, there's a bunch of tools out there, but arguably my favorite <clears throat> And even my favorite out of the Proxmark versions, uh, the Proxmark 3, the RDV2 uh, version. Uh, so specifically, the Proxmark 3 uh, is a tool for interacting with uh, RFID, both high frequency uh, and low frequency for doing some really deep analysis as well as some utility type of uh, application for interacting with various RFID tags. And in this case, we're specifically focused uh, on the HID Prox 2. Uh, hardware uh, was uh, the original Proxmark 3 designed by Jonathan Westhues uh, and software by uh, Gerhard uh, de Koning Gans uh, and a few uh, others uh, as well as part of the project. And uh, the software and hardware has seen some evolution uh, over time. Uh, the thing that I think that is fantastic about the Proxmark, uh, while it's complex potentially in its usage through uh, the tethered software, uh, attaching it to our computer, uh, it gives us the ability to read tags, interrogate them, find out all the values, um, find out its feature set capabilities, and even determine its types. It has the, also the ability to become a card, a tag, itself, meaning it can receive the data and then transmit that data back as if it was an actual card. Okay. Uh, it's typically USB based when we're interacting with it with the Proxmark 3 software. It does also work in standalone mode. We'll cover that. Uh, but uh, typically we're interacting with it uh, over USB uh, to uh, manipulate the device with the Proxmark 3 software. And that Proxmark 3 software has multiple different options you know, and some of that evolution over, over time. Um, one of the more prevalent is the uh, Iceman version of the Proxmark 3 uh, software. Uh, we've seen some uh, from Brad Antonowitz uh, introducing the ability to do uh, brute forcing on HID cards with Proxbrute, uh, and even some potential uh, interesting uh, custom versions uh, for the Holiday Hack Challenge. All right, so with the Proxmark 3 uh, attached to our computer over USB, uh, using the Proxmark 3 software, we can in fact read the cards, get their unique values, and then get the Proxmark 3 to replay those values into the air, acting as if we had the physical card. This allows us to effectively perform cloning type of attacks. Now, we can do capture and effectively replay, and we can do capture and uh, push that data to a brand new card so we can actually have physical card medium as opposed to this piece of uh, electronics. Now, there's no prevention for anyone for reading these tags. Uh, we just need to present it uh, to the reader. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're uh, connected to the Proxmark 3 software. We've got our Proxmark 3 connected uh, via USB. Uh, and we issue the uh, low frequency hid read command. It reads a card present uh, to the antenna uh, in very close proximity. And it tells us that uh, it's a 26-bit uh, HID uh, gives us our facility code of 149 and our card number of 64899. Okay. And then some uh, some raw data uh, down on the bottom with lots of zero, leading zeros. And if you take a look, the card that we read uh, over here on the right, uh, we do have some values uh, printed on the card is 64899. Uh, and then the 1126-1137-1 uh, being that unique purchase order tracking number. So the unique number for this card was 64899, which we recovered as the CN with our low frequency hit read. And we also recovered that facility code, the FC of 149, the part that's only inspected in RF. 
Once we have that data, we can use the low frequency hid simulate or sim command and use some raw data to spit those same card values back out into the air from our Proxmark 3 and then present our Proxmark 3 to the reader, uh, which the reader thinks a valid card has been presented. Uh, in this case, we are using uh, the raw data with the uh, the leading zeros uh, trimmed off. So you note on our LF hid read, we have that raw data at the bottom with a bunch of zeros uh, starting 2401. Uh, we just use that 2401 uh, for uh, the replay um, for the raw data with the low frequency hid simulate. So super easy, read and effectively replay. We can also clone to a uh, a new card. Now the standard hid prox two tags are uh, not writable. That facility and ID code cannot be changed. They're read only cards. But as you remember, they are commodity Atmel T5557 or T5577s. And there are some enterprising firms that have purchased these Atmel chipsets and provide them to the consumer uh, in a, quote, magic version, and I'm using air quotes here, uh, to make them writable. Now, it's, they're... They're questionable in, uh, you know, how HID wants folks to sell these, um, but they can't do a ton of restriction because they are a publicly available chipset from Amazon, uh, from uh, from Atmel. Uh, and I've had really great luck in being able to, to find some of these, uh, both through eBay uh, and uh, Amazon and Amazon Prime <laughs> today uh, by searching for a uh, writable T5557. Uh, and sometimes you'll get the models that come back of the T5577. Uh, okay, so how would we actually write this to uh, a new card? Uh, well, first one, uh, instead of doing uh, the uh, LF hid read, we can just do LF search, and it tries to find all of the possible uh, low frequency card present to the antenna. Uh, and in this case, uh, it did find that we had uh, that same uh, HID card with the um, facility code of 149 and the 64899 for the unique card identifier and its raw data. So it attempts to read all of the low frequency tags and uh, until it discovers one. Once we have that, that raw data, uh, we can write that to a new card. Uh, with the low frequency LF hid clone. Uh, and the clone is not simulating that data into the air. It's actually uh, pushing it to a, uh, a new blank card uh, with the T5557 chipset and writing that raw data to it. Uh, it says it's preparing to clone. You present the card, it writes the data, uh, and then you have a new physical uh, card. All right, uh, it is possible to do uh, standalone um, cloning or capture and uh, replay because well if we're going to do a capture and replay uh, that device you know it's really small fits in the palm of your hand but it's now attached to your laptop with a usb cable when you're issuing some commands and so forth um, and that's not very stealthy that's quite obvious to uh, surreptitiously bump into someone on the bus or outside of the building uh, and that's you're going to get caught doing that type of stuff. So uh, the Proxmark 3 can also perform untethered cl cloning, meaning if you uh, provide it with some power like a uh, portable USB phone charger type thing or the optional internal battery for the RDV2, uh, we can power it and then use that one button uh, on the Proxmark 3 with the various sets of key presses to read hid tags. Uh, and once it reads a tag, it will automatically start simulating, just like issuing that uh, LF hid simulate command for the most recent tag that was read. So, uh, and we can do that with that small device battery powered in the palm of our hand. The challenge becomes, what happens if we read a tag with the unique identifier and a facility code. And typically that facility code is going to be the same for every that, that run of cards that we order. Uh, so let's say Santa's Workshop, facility code 149. Every card that has access to Santa's Workshop will typically have uh, the facility code of 149. And the unique card identifiers are the part uh, that change. 
Now it is possible to buy cards um, that are randomized, but you definitely pay a premium uh, for that. Uh, and, and I've only er encountered uh, one organization that uh, has ever uh, had fully admitted that uh, they randomized all of their facility codes and uh, their card numbers. Uh, and they said they paid you know, exorbitant amounts of money to be able to make that happen. Now, part of the reason why they did so is if you think about how you're buying your cards, you're getting them in, say, a chunk of 100 or 500 cards. And they're all shrink-wrapped. You, you, you open the shrink-wrap, and then uh, you start programming the cards. And, you know, the first, your first card out, you program the system, and that's the, the security team, uh, meaning the physical security team. They have access to everything so that they can do their inspections. Uh, and then maybe you uh, end up with the C-level executives, and they have access to everything. And then you start moving down uh, down the chain. You, you have your uh, computer administrators that need access to the computer room, uh, and then you get down to your administrative assistants and your interns that just need access to the front door. But let's say uh, you uh, recover a card, and uh, it's for the administrative assistant. You can get into the front door of the multi-tenant facility. You can get into the office suite, but you present that card to the data center door, and it doesn't allow you in because now you have the card of a lower privilege user and you need to elevate your rights. Well, if we think about that, you know, that's that administrative assistant that has likely gotten that card uh, you know, towards the end of the run, meaning they have the higher number. So if we think about those cards that were delivered, they're typically sequentially numbered. So if we look at this one here, uh, up in the top middle, we've got uh, 15573, and then we go over to the left, uh, 574, 575, second, third one in, uh, go back one, 576, um, 578, 579, 580, 581. There's no 577. But I'd argue that it's probably the card that's turned over in the front here, uh, where we can't see the number. So they're sequentially numbered. Maybe they're a little bit out of order. Uh, you know, maybe we dropped them uh, as we were taking a couple of them out. Uh, so they're they're close. So if we can read one card and recover the facility code, maybe we need to start guessing other card numbers because the card number that we read doesn't provide us access. But those with lower numbers, and in some case higher numbers, usually lower numbers, uh, will allow us to get into places where uh, the card number that we read uh, doesn't allow us to, but reusing that same facility code. Okay. So uh, with that, thinking um, about uh, some of those facility codes and those card numbers, uh, I do uh, very much encourage you to uh, have fun during the holiday hack challenge and explore the use of a, a Proxmark 3 uh, within uh, within the challenge. And a huge thanks to uh, the holiday hack challenge team that uh, puts all of this on and spends so much time uh, crafting this game and, you know, giving this to uh, to the community during the holidays. So, and, and again, a big thanks uh, to Santa uh, and uh, everyone involved. And please uh, go enjoy, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Ho, 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 ho.